Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Thank you again for joining me here at the back of the range. I'm your host, Ben Adelberg, and this is episode 26. Well, we definitely had some drama this past week at the U.S. Open at Shinnecock Hills. I think I could ramble on just like everyone else about the course set up on Saturday and Phil's uh, questionable putting display, but let's focus on the positive. Tommy Fleetwood made a great run at the title, but we now have our first back-to-back U.S. Open champion since Curtis Strange. So congrats to Brooks Kepka, a South Florida guy no less, for pulling out the gutty victory. Again, need to thank Joe Buck for being our guest last week on the podcast. I thought Fox's coverage was good, and they'll only get better. If you didn't get a chance to listen to Joe's episode, which was number 25, you can listen to it and all the previous ones by heading over to thebackoftherange.com. Remember, we're also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and you'll find all that information in the show notes of this podcast. If you are watching and listening to the U.S. Open closely this past weekend, you might have heard Tim Rosefort or Peter Costas mention a man named Bob Toskey. Bob is a legend in the game of golf, and I'm going to give you a couple reasons why. He joined the PGA Tour in 1948 and broke through for his first win at the Insurance City Open in 1953. He was the leading money winner in 1954 when his four victories included the World Championship of Golf. Perhaps the main reason that Mr. Toski is such a legend is because of his pioneering work as a golf instructor. To quote Peter Costas, every teacher today owes him a debt of gratitude because he made it possible to earn a living teaching golf. Shouldn't surprise anyone that Mr. Toski is a member of the World Golf Professional Hall of Fame. Fortunately, I was invited into Bob's home about a month ago to sit down and record this episode. We spent four amazing hours talking about his life in and around the game of golf. Now, a couple things about this episode. You might hear birds chirping in the background. That's one of his clocks. I didn't edit that out. You might hear Bob slamming his hand down on the table when he was making a point. Yeah, I didn't edit that out either. In fact, I really didn't edit much of anything out of this episode. This was a special day with a true legend of the game. Now, unfortunately, Bob had a heart attack on the Saturday before the U.S. Open. But true to his fighting spirit, he is making tremendous strides, and I know the entire world of golf is hoping for a speedy recovery. Oh, by the way, he's 91 years old. So, let's get to the episode now. Bob, you're a guest here at the back of the range, but I kind of feel like I'm the honored guest this week. You've welcomed me into your amazing home here in Boca Raton, Florida. I think I'm in love with this house more than you'd probably like me to be. Well, I'm in love with it too. It's just unique. It's unique. It's it's a California style tree house. It's built off the ground because of the low land. Sure. And as you can see, it's all wood. Uh, I I walked and in here. 152 windows in my house. All the outside comes in, as you can see. Yes. No, I, our our listeners are not going to be getting the full scope of what I'm looking at here. But I'm just I'm almost walking through a a golf museum. The first thing I see when I look on the wall is your picture of you and your, and your, your lovely wife with the world golf uh, championship trophy from 1954. The largest trophy in the history of golf. See how big the trophy I, is? I, yes, I do. There's I'm no look- trophy bigger than that. <laughs> it looks like, it looks like you two are standing next to a Volkswagen. I mean, that thing's monstrous. Um, tell, tell me about that, that event. Uh, that was George May, correct? George May. George May was a great promoter. He became at odds with the PGA because, see, uh, George was such a great promoter and raised the purses of golf. And uh, the PGA didn't, you know, if you weren't a member of the RNA, if you weren't a member of the PGA, if you weren't a member of of this and that, and George was a promoter. And it ended up where he and the PGA didn't get along, and that's when – he stopped having the tournament, but a lot of people don't know that. But he was a promoter and a smart, smart man. So this tournament, I mean, just to put in perspective, so your first place winnings of this tournament was $50,000 in 1954. Right. And what was pretty much the the winner's check of a normal tour event around those well, times? Well, I, I had won my first tournament for $2,000 at Hartford. Okay. Then I won at Baton Rouge. Uh, 
153, uh, I won in August. Uh, the Insurance City opened 2000. I won the Baton Rouge Open for 2000. I won the uh, Azalea in Wilmington for 2000. Then I won the Eastern Open for 4000. I said, well, man, this is big time. And then I went to the World Championship and won the uh, $50,000 first prize purse. And and that's basically, just to put it in perspective for people today that follow the PGA Tour, you know, if you win the season long FedEx Cup, that's a ten million dollar annuity for that per, for that player. Right, fifty thousand is almost kind of like winning ten million dollars in one tournament. Well, I'll tell you one thing: I'd like to win five tournaments today <laughs> compared to nine and fifty four. <laughs> How much money would plus the uh, the uh, the amount of money you make on on on, on endorsements the, and these guys are walking billboards now. I know, I know. Well, you know, the, I remember some guy said he he got a contract for chewing tobacco. They, somebody gave him a con- <laughs> chewing tobacco. <laughs> so so how did I mean just. You said you got your start on tour in 1949. 48. 48, I played, I'm sorry. I played a winter tour in 48 and then a winter tour in 49. Then I started playing full-time in 50. Okay. You know, nowadays there's all these different mini tours, these challenge tours and web.com tours and, and sponsors that are giving money to college kids, just, you know, equipment deals right out of college. So they have this full bankroll and full support right behind them when they get started. How did you get your start? How did you transition and say, I'm, I'm going to go play professionally? Well, you got to understand that uh, there was no television. Sure. There, right. there wasn't any money. The first prize was $2,000. First, the total purse was $10,000. First prize was 2000 And when you finished last, you got $50 because – Big corporations weren't involved because there was no television. Once television got into golf and the big corporations use this as a means of advertising, then what happens to the persons? Sure, they go up. Big time. This is what started television and big sponsors, big corporations got involved in golf. And that's just, and it all started with George May. He was the first guy to, yeah. to start to increase the persons. I played a couple of uh, exhibitions with Doug Ford and and uh, Ted Kroll. They came down to an exhibition at my club in Northampton, Mass. Okay. And they told Jack, Bobby needs to go on tour. He can play. Okay. And we want him to go on tour. So I, I finally went on tour with Ted Kroll and Milo Marusic. We traveled in a Studebaker, <laughs> three in a Studebaker. Okay. I was in the back seat were behind the clothes racks. You couldn't see me. <laughs> so if you want to see me, I was in the back seat of the clothes racks. They were in the two. Three of us in one car. And we go to a motel. They, there are two beds and a cot. Who slept in the cot? I did. You did. Between one guy snoring and the other guy grinding his teeth. <laughs> these, these kids today have no idea what it was like back then. And the greens weren't that good. The fairways weren't that good. But we didn't care. We just wanted to compete and play golf. So I went on tour because it was a fascination of competing with the best players in the world and seeing the world. Uh, I couldn't wait to go to a new city, see a new course, meet some of the new players. That was a kid from Boys Town. <laughs> sure. And I was... I was fascinated with competing, and and I didn't know how good I was going to be. I was just wanted to compete and get better and try to make a living playing golf. Clear, clearly, you had what it took to succeed on tour, uh, yeah, and especially in the era that you were there. I mean, you're coming up right around the time of, uh, you know, Byron Nelson with his eleven victories in a row. You're eighteen, eighteen. He won eighteen tournaments in one year, eleven in a row. That will never be equal. Byron Nelson was one of the greatest ball strikers and probably they didn't call him Lord Byron for nothing. He, to me, was the Lord. Okay. There are two people that stand out. Bobby Jones and Byron Nelson were complete gentlemen. Uh, in, in golf, you carried yourself like a gentleman. Mm-hmm. You, when you, and I'm sure when you, 
you didn't you didn't raise your fist in defiance that I'm this and I'm that. You tipped your cap, touched your cap, and said thank you. That was the way golf was presented. Sure, and that's the way we had to act. Act like a gentleman. So, did you travel any with with Nelson or or? No, I traveled with Ted Cole. He okay. was responsible. Ted Cole became my best mentor. Okay. I was best man at his wedding. He's passed away, but I I owe a lot to Ted. He uh, he, he 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 every day he would teach me and spend hours with me on the practice. And then when I started hitting it good, he'd call Byron or Ben, uh, not Ben, but Byron and S- Sam or Middle. He says, "Come over and watch." He called me Swifty because I, I was so quick. I had quick strength. And he says, what do you think of Swift? He's swinging. They says, boy, you're doing a good job, Ted. He's looking better all the time. And he'd always call them over to, to, to kind of make sure that he was teaching me right. Sure. And that's the way golf was. Today, now you need a guru. You need a mind bender. You need a psychologist. You need a therapist. <laughs> so so at that time, it was just just – just the guys are just working on each other's no, swings. Uh, just uh, uh, we, we, do, we couldn't afford it, but no, I mean, just everybody the helped players. each other. So, yeah, the just players the, helped the players. Right. Okay. That's, that's what made my, the fifties. I can't thank the fifties and, and the Nelsons and, and the Mangrams and the Sneeds and the middle Those people ingratiated me and took me in. And the, the marriage said it better than anyone. He says, I used to say, well, they think I'm too small and too light and Polish and dumb. He says, you're not too dumb. You're not. You're too, he says, if you're good enough, you're big enough. And you are so good. Don't ever think you're not big enough. You're as good as your golf swing. And you got a big golf swing. And you got a great golf swing. You got a small body. But you know how to play golf. So don't. if you're good enough, you're big enough. Don't you ever forget that, Bob. Yeah. You're coming on to the tour and you, you get your first win 1949, correct? No, I won. I, I started a full time in 50. Full time in 50, I'm sorry. And I won my first time in 52 at Insurance City Open in Hartford. Okay. So you're, you're, when you get invited to play in something like the Masters, you played in, I think, four Masters or, or three. three Masters you played in. So we, we spoke about this earlier. The invite to getting to play at Augusta National being able to drive down Magnolia Lane, just as special back then as it is for the pros today? Oh, without a doubt. Masters is the best run tournament. Why is it the best run tournament in golf? They do it at the same golf course every year. It's not a transition from another course to another city. And every year they know how to improve the running of the golf. But it's a special, it's a special invitation of the tournament. To me, the Masters is if you're going to die and you didn't want to go to hell and you went to heaven and you went to the pearly gates, that's when you went to the Masters. And when I drove in the Magnolia Lane, I says, this is heaven. I think Moses is on the other end there waiting to say hello to me. <laughs> that's the psychological effect the Masters has. Okay. So, and, and I met Bobby Jones. Oh, please. And when he met me, he says, Bobby, welcome to the Masters. And I says, thank you, Bobby. I'm I'm going to call you Bobby. He says, yes, I wish because everybody does call me Bobby. I says, well, we got two Bobbies. <laughs> so the, um, I just, yeah, I, I can't imagine what that, what that was like just playing in, in the, in the Masters and. But it was meeting Jones. To me, it was meeting. Because okay. I admired this guy. This guy was brilliant. He was the all American boy. no. Yeah, the, the, the all American boy in golf was Arnold Palmer. Okay. Arnold was the, I called him the all American boy because he was the all American boy. You remember the all American boy? Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think he advertised Wheaties and whatever. Oh, yeah. Pets Arnold, oil and all the. Ar- yeah. Arnold became the all American boy in my mind. Yeah. And, but Jones was probably most, well, probably the most brilliant mind in golf. The guy. He's an amateur beating all these golf pros. And he, he had that Southern charm. He was a Southern boy. And everybody ingratiated him. The guy, you know, the guy had a hell of a temper. Yeah. 
Yeah, they used to throw clubs. <laughs> so, I didn't care if a guy threw a club, but if he could make the next shot, that's all that counted. But if he kept throwing clubs and still hitting it bad, then I said, you're going to run out of clubs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any particular year that you played the Masters um, that, that really uh, jumped out at you? Any any fond memories of any rounds that you no, played? No, I, I, I didn't play as well as I wanted to because I didn't feel like uh, I was strong enough to play that type of a golf course because it was long and hilly and the greens were undulating and they were you could go on i could put you on 18 holes at the masters I put the ball on the green on 18 times right let me put the ball on the green and you're a scratch player and i'll put the ball on the green 60 70 80 feet every time from the hole you yeah. probably won't break 80 yeah you'll probably never make one putt and you'll probably three putts six or seven times or eight times that's how this is what's happened to golf Today, the greens are big and underly. When we played and, and the tour, the greens were small and you putted from a, a nine to a 10 degree speed. Now it's 13. Now you got speed and break and it's almost, it's like putting on this table here. Yeah. So do, do you, man, this is just opening all sorts of questions and all sorts of doors. Um, so let me go in that direction. By you saying that today the game is more about controlling it on the green. Well, they've and, lengthened the golf courses. Right, okay. And they made the greens larger and more contour. Right. Now, we never heard of a double break when we played. Okay. <laughs> it was either broke right. Now we can get break right and break left. Sure. You might get a triple break. Right. <laughs> so the, the, the game is because the architecture – the architects have tried to make the game more difficult for the tour player because they're so strong. They hit it so far. They're trying to make it more difficult for them. So that's why you have a change in architecture because the players today drive the ball 300 yards. I mean, when you drove the ball 280 on the tour, that was long. Right. But then now it's not just that, that players can hit it farther. It's almost like, Every player hits it far. It's not like there's just like a couple guys that are oh, the no. big bashers. Well, Everyone can but, do it. But it's, they talk about the equipment. It's not the equipment. Okay. So what's yeah, if the, if the equipment was that good for the player, then how come the average and high handicap player hasn't gotten any better? I'm a teacher of golf. Yeah. I've been teaching golf for 60 some odd years. How come the average handicap player hasn't gotten any better? The equipment is better. The courses are better. The ball's better. Why aren't they better? Because they suck. <laughs> their their hand eye coordination is still bad. So, is the golf club going to help them? It helps the tour player who's very sensitive to weight, speed, flex, and he can adjust to that because he's he's got a pair of trained hands and a trained mind, and they they take advantage of the good equipment. But the average handicap player, yeah, you know what? The club doesn't know where it's going. Yeah, the I'm club doesn't know how fast it's. So the player, so sure, the tour pros take advantage of the the equipment and the golf ball. Now they're the the equipment and the ball, and the, but it's club head speed. Sure. So once you increase mass velocity times squared, the ball is going to go further. But the average tour player today is six foot tall, two hundred pounds average. You're six three. A lot of guys are six three. Now they weigh two twenty, two thirty. I was five foot seven and a half, weighed one hundred and eighteen pounds. They told me I should have been a jockey. <laughs> so it's all that. That's what's the the big. What, how about basketball? Sure. What's going to happen? What are you going to have to do to the baskets? Well, I think you need to make the courts bigger. They're making it bigger. What do you think they did at the Masters? They went back to the eleventh hole and they they put a tee back there two hundred yards. Yeah, I think eleventh what playing like five ten now. The eleventh hole at Augusta is playing like five hundred. Well, I remember we used to play. They had a wedge in there. Now they're hitting. They're bailing out with four irons into the green. Yeah. Well, we got the players hit the ball so far. That's why when Tiger shot eighteen under, I think yeah. four eight twelve sixty. He he averaged over four. 400 par per round because he birdied all the par fives. All the par fives were par fours. So if they're par fours, it's, his par was not 72, it was 68. 
So when he won the tournament and shot and won by, I don't know how many shots, they called in Tom Fazio and said, hey, Tom, we got to lengthen the golf course. That was the, the tiger proofing and bringing the, the rough in and making it longer and all that stuff that they did for. Well, the tiger had nothing to do with that. He, we shot such a low score. They said, when I got to come here and turn this course upside down again. Yep. That was the last time that happened. Um, wow. I have just, gosh. All right. So let's, let me throw this question at you. Um, just throw anything at me. Oh, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but, I, <laughs> but, but, uh, cause you'll, you'll take me, but. So your nickname, when your nickname on the tour was the mouse, who gave yeah. you that nickname? Sam. Okay. Sam Sneed. Sam said, uh, he would call me mouse. He said, mouse, you're so small and light. You should have been a jockey. He says, we played an exhibition in, 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 uh, Kansas city. And then, and, and the wind was blowing on the first hole about 20 miles an hour in our face. And I hit this low drive. Hit it low and ran it down the fairway. Sam hits his drive and goes down there, and he's only about 10 yards in front of me. And he looks at my ball and he says, Hey, man, that's a pretty good drive. You're only 10 yards in back of me. <laughs> he said, You ought to get a two stroke penalty for high jumping at the point of impact. <laughs> he said, You had both feet off the ground. I said, Sam. My ball's right back of yours and it's right in the middle of the fairway. I want you to try to hit a drive with both feet off the ground and see how well you can put it in the middle of the fairway. And he looked at me and he said, hey, man, I'll show what kind of books you're reading. I said, good ones. <laughs> um, how did you fit in with with the dynamic of, of the guys like, like Hogan and Nelson and Snead? I mean, it just obviously you were there. I was not. But when you look at the the way maybe everyone was portrayed Sneed was like, you just kind of alluded to a little more the, the, the Joker and more, a little more of an outgoing personality. Well, no, was Hogan if, really the recluse that maybe everyone says no, he Hogan was? was an introvert. Okay. We were all extroverts. Okay. And, and we would pick on each other. We'd go out and have a, we'd have a, we go out and have dinner, a party of six or seven. And it was who could tell the best story. Okay. To do one up Okay. And, and then, and and boy, we just picked on each other. And if you could handle that, you became one of the boys. And you had to know how to handle that stuff. And you know, like Trevino said, I was the only golf boy you knew I had to take a shower with a lifeguard. Wait a minute, hold on. Repeat that. You're the only golf pro that he said. He, I'm. He's the only golf pro that I know that had to take a shower with a lifeguard because if I didn't, he said I I drown. Oh gosh. And he said, and they gave me the, if, if Bob didn't have an Adam's apple, you wouldn't have any shape at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they gave me all these nicknames. Sure. So they, they but they, but they gave you, they, they because gave, they know they, right. they, they love me. Right. Cause they can give you the shit. The first you can thing take they it. said, I can't believe how far this kid can drive a golf ball for his size. The first thing they realized is I had club and speed. I had what we call, Deer like strength. That's quick strength. Quick, yes. Now, how does a deer bounce? He bounces because his feet leave the air. How, how fast is he going to run up at one? I told you about Jack Nicholas and the key, keeping the heel down. Yeah. No, I, well, you, you, no, well, I didn't I elaborate that story. Yeah. But when I went to see Jack, I said, Jack, when you swung the golf club, your left heel came off the ground about two to three or four inches. He said, I said, why are they changing to keep the left heel down on the backswing now? He said, well, that's one less move they have to make so they think there's a less margin of error. So now the player, but once you once you don't move that lower body that way, then you're going to be more of an upper body player. And the lower body has to support the upper body on the way down to the golf swing. Your legs are heavier and slower muscles than your arms and hands. So when you watch a good player to get to the top of the swing, he hasn't even completed the backswing. He's already starting to do what? Move forward. No, shifting forward. Shifting forward. You shift in place. Yes. You don't shift out of place. And that's why you, they did that subconsciously because your legs being a lot heavier than your arms need a head start. So then your arms have to follow your legs and play catch up. Then your hands catch up to your arms. And then the club catches up to your hands. And if the timing is right, but if you keep the heel down, 
The swing's going to get shorter. It's going to get tighter. The back, the lower back problem can, you can have a lower, uh, uh, the extremities, the lower body, there's so much tension. We, we never played golf with tension. It was, golf was a free swinging motion. Golf was swing with grace and ease, then your body you will please. But if you swing too hard and fast, you're going to fall right on your ass. There you go. There you there go. There it is. Absolutely. And the reason why golfers hurt themselves is because they try to hit the ball too far. They use too much exerted effort to move the club faster. Their body then gets out of control. And if there are weights on your back foot while you're moving forward, your lower lumbar region is going to. This is why they have these injuries. Yeah. So there, there's no doubt about your credentials as an instructor. Now, you left the tour after your victories, after the world championship. You wanted 1957, to... I retired from the tour. Okay. And... I started teaching. Started teaching. So, you know, when I was telling people who I was coming to see today to speak to, and, and I said, well, y- you can make all sorts of arguments, but when you look at all of the golf instructional videos and the, the, the schools you can go to and the, the, uh, you know, golf Academy live on the golf channel. A lot of that started when golf digest schools, when golf digest, um, started with the instructional schools that you were a part of. When, when did that, that started in the seventies. Is that correct? Well, the school started in the seventies. Okay. When I started teaching at, at ocean reef in the keys. Okay. I started Jane Blaylock, Judy Rankin, Judy Turlump. A lot of the women pros came to see me. Okay. Uh, and the word got back to Golf Digest that this kid, Bob Toskey, is having a lot of success in teaching women how to play golf because they were my size. size. And the word got back to Golf Digest, Bill Davis and Howie Gill. They said, we'd like to have you join our panel. Who was on the panel? Byron, Henry Ransom, Paul Runyon. And I became a member of the panel. And this was in 1960 or one or two. So once I joined the panel, and they're listening to my knowledge of the golf swing, Jerry Tardy and and some of the writers said, Dick Altman said, you ought to consider having golf schools. So Bill Davis and Howie Gill called me over. They said, we were told that you need, you should have golf schools. And I said, they said, what makes you think golf schools are going to be successful? And they said, there hadn't been any golf schools that were successful. I said, why? Because if you've got four instructors and they're all teaching a different philosophy, you got confusion amongst the students. Everybody's got to be on the same page. You got to teach what I know and you teach what I know and teach it the way I teach it. And if I want you to change, I'll let you know. So if we're all the teachers are on the same page and the, and the communication skills are the same. So they put me in, in a place called Cole Harbor in the Bahamas, the first golf school. They sent me down to the Bahamas. I got Dick Altman and I, the only two instructors. And we had about 12 students. And after the second day, the students, Dick Altman comes to me in my room at about 9 o'clock at night. No, 8 o'clock. And he's evidently got, he got a little popped. And I said, Dick, what's wrong? You, you look, he said, the students are going to leave. I says, why are they leaving? The place was under receivership. Oh, shit. They booked me into a place that was under receivership. The range balls were the color of this table, brown. Okay. Fairways were brown. The food was poor. The service was poor. And they said, we love the instruction, but we didn't pay for this. And if we don't, Dick says, we don't find another place to go. They're going to leave. No, no. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There's a guy named George Storer, Storer Broadcasting. George owns a total number of 
radio and TV stations who are allowed to own under SEC regulation. Okay. Now, Lyford Key, which is the best resort in the Bahamas, right next to where we were, 10 minutes from us. So my mind, all of a sudden I say, George Storer. And I know he was at Lyford Key in his yacht. So I called Lyford Key. I said, I need to talk to George Storer. Well, he's on, he's on, he's out on the sea. He's at ship to shore. We will try to get you to communicate with him. So they got me on the line with him. George says, Bob, what are you doing in the Bahamas? I said, I'm having, I got a golf school here. He says, where are you? Where's your golf school? I says, at Cold Harbor. He said, that place is a dump. What are you doing there? <laughs> I said, George, I got a problem. My students are all going to leave. They're unhappy with the food, the service, the accommodations. And if I don't find a place for them to go to finish the school, we're history. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll have to call on my board. I'll probably get back to you within an hour. Calls me back on an hour. He says, bust them in in the morning. We went from, to, we now we're in cabanas. We got range balls that are brand new titles. The golf pro from Canada is can There was nobody there. To, it's, this is in the middle of April. Everybody's gone home. The Canadians have gone home. Sure. Now we got the whole place to ourselves. So and that's what, and if it hadn't been for George Storer, the golf digest schools would have never gotten off the ground. Wow. And those schools, I mean, gosh, I just. And I, we went 1970 to 1990 for 20 years all over the world. We had the most successful golf school program in the history of golf. Four or five of my teachers are in the Hall of Fame. And who are those? Hank, you got. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Right, well. Now you're taxing my brain. Okay. Well, we got Davis Love. Yeah. Jim Flick. Yeah. Bob Toski, Eddie Marins, Peter Costas. Peter, no, he did, he had to make. Let's see, Runyon, Wyron. Runyon, Wyron, you, Wyron, yeah, Flick, and they all came out of the golf schools. Yeah, there is no, there will never be another golf school. Now, golf digest realizes the magnitude of selling magazines. And they're using the golf schools as a means of enticing people. So if we got 36 students, they guarantee 36 students that they got to buy the magazine. Sure. And they're all going to tell their friends. So basically these golf schools, not just you're not just instructing these people coming in, but it's almost like you're now you have Golf Digest magazine ambassadors because when they get done with the school, they're going to tell all their friends and everyone at their clubs. Oh, yeah. Hey, I learned so much. Oh, it's all because of Golf Digest. But what I learned then was – I'm teaching non-athletic people. Yeah. I, I'm teaching people that have stone hands, bad <laughs> grips, bad posture. They have no clue as to how ugly they look. So what would have been, what's the biggest reward for you at that time? Getting someone that was like a 15 handicapper into your school and, and shaving a couple of strokes? Oh, big time. That was your biggest, okay. So well, that's your biggest challenge. Okay, so the 15. You can take an 18 and bring them to 15 or 12. He thinks you're God. Okay. Anybody can take, I can take you, a gifted athlete, and and if you're a two, then I'd have to teach you how to shoot low, shoot, become a tour player. Now i got to take you to another level. So that's, but the yeah. communication skills to you are entirely different than the, the novice. I talk differently to you. Right. I have a different language. Yeah. And teaching poor players made me a greater teacher and made all my teachers better players. A better, not only better players, but better teachers. Because, man, I'll tell you one thing. You have no idea. I mean, just some How difficult <laughs> it is for people to understand how to improve their golf swings when they have so little knowledge about the fundamentals and, and how to time and sense and feel a golf club striking a golf ball to get the ball to go any distance. Right. Right. So you're now you typically, at least from what, what I've 
researched and looked at is that your students, you don't have a lot of the high profile tour star uh, students. I know you've worked with Tom Kite. I know you worked with. with well, the, 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 but I mean, you're not like the out on the tour traveling with them like a Ledbetter, like a, um, uh, you know, like, like a lot no, of No, if other- you're a famous doctor, you don't have to go see anybody. They'll come what? They'll come see you. They go to Mayo Clinic. There you go. Because that's where all the greatest doctors are. Right. They have to come to me. I'm not going to go to them. I don't need them. They need me. So if they don't think they need me because I'm old fashioned and over the hill, so be it. But that's what golf is today. The, all these kids that are now teaching these tour players, I'm sorry, but they couldn't hold a candle to me. Well, I mean, and we talked a lot about this before we started recording, just a lot of the the, the highly technical things with with launch angles and, and track man and, and biomechanics, and, and it's taken the feel out. So – you're big about the hands touch the club. That's the most important thing. And it's all about the feel. Is that kind of how you communicated? Your- what are the two greatest killers in golf? Anxiety and tension. Yeah. Eliminate tension and anxiety. Hold the club with a light grip and swing the club with a nice, smooth, easy swing. Right. But th- that's not the norm. Golf is a nonviolent game played violently from within. Why is it played violently from within? Because you try to strike the golf ball at a distance with more effort and speed that you can't control. You can only swing a golf club at a rate of speed in which your hands and arms can bear through your eyes. And if you, if, if you don't understand that you better swing at 80 miles an hour and try to put it in the fairway instead of 120 miles an hour, and you're looking for balls all day long, then you, you're you pretty stupid. So I took a guy named Ken Duke. Yes. Probably one of the greatest things I've done in teaching. He came to me when he was 40 years old. He played at St. Andrews where I'm the pro emeritus yeah. in the pro-am. He won the pro-am. He was a, a journeyman all over the world. And I couldn't believe when I taught him, he had no idea what the hell a golf swing is all. And he's been playing golf all over the world and had no clue about the fundamentals of the golf swing. He's playing by by feel and instinct, which was incorrect. His fun of, He would aim left and swing right. I says, if you aim left, you swing left and let the goal ball go curve to the right. If you aim right, you swing right and curve it left. You don't aim right and swing left and aim left and swing right. And he was just kind of... Now, he's 40 years old. Uh-huh. And just now he's coming to you to figure all this stuff out. No, he, 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 I'm, having, uh, I'm having drinks with the pros, and he comes over and he says, you got a minute? I said, sure. And I had never met him before. I said, Ken do. He says, uh, would you think about spending some time with me and giving me lessons? He was living in Boca at the time. Sure. Yeah. I said, here's my number. Call me. And I said, that's it. And I didn't, I had too busy. And you know, like I ran him off. I said, here's my number. Give me a call. If you're serious, call me. He calls me. We got on my driving range. We spent four hours, four hours I spent with him. And he's aiming over there. And then all of a sudden he swings over there and he wants to know why the ball pushed. I said, why are you swinging over here and swinging over there? I said, if you were aiming a putt, that's going to break to the right, you'd have to start the ball in the wear. And just, just so people listening understand what you're motioning towards, he's he's physically aiming left and swinging right. Is that what you're saying? He's swinging in the wrong direction. Okay. Swing okay. where you're what? Swing, your, swing where you're aiming. Oh, he didn't hit, He didn't have a clue. Okay. All right. We spent four hours. So I, I said, here's a pitching wedge. There's a flag right there, about 50 yards in front of you. Aim that club at that flag. Can you swing the club and make that ball go toward that flag? Straight, not right, not left. Just nice, easy swing. Let me see you just make contact. And he's pitching the ball right at the flag. And I said, now we're going to go to that flag out there. So the minute he went to a further flag, he started aiming where? He started going back to his old what? I said, no, you better keep aiming at that flag. You better square your body up. Get squared. Square the club face. Square your body. Well, I'm going to make a long story short. Four hours, he finishes. He goes to the next tournament, almost wins the tournament. 
goes to the next tournament, almost wins that one. I call him on the phone. I says, he said, this is like stealing. <laughs> I said, well, you now know where to aim and where to swing. What have you been doing all your life? Here's a guy that never took any golf lessons. And now he's, I said to him, I'm going to get you on a major tour. I guarantee I'll get you on the big tour. Now, so when he came, just to, just for time reference, so when he came to you, he was not on the PGA tour. He was playing web.com or who's he playing? Mini- playing? He's playing over in Europe and Asia. He okay, was, so you just he played a, any, anywhere he could play. He was a play. vagabond. He's a va- okay, so anywhere he could He's play. a gypsy. Okay, so you start getting him and you get him onto the PGA tour. No, no. I, no okay. You're trying to put words into my mouth. Okay. I said, I'll help you get on the PGA tour. Gotcha. But you're going to have to stay with me. Okay. And I'm going to. You're going to have to get serious. He starts playing better and playing better. Now he's got to go. Th- he's got to go to this tournament. He's got to finish third to get his card to go on the tour. Okay. And at the last day of the tournament, the wind's blowing in. He, I know he can knock the ball down. I taught him how to knock the ball down. I said, these guys are going to be throwing the ball nine miles in the air, and they're going to be looking in the trees and the bushes. You better trap it and knock it down. And if you can do that, he almost won the tournament. Made his card. And I said, now I'll teach you how to win on the big tour. So at the end of four years, now he's 44 years old. He's playing in the Hartford Open. And now he's playing good. He's golfing his ball. He went from the worst driver. To, he's one of the best drivers on the tour right now. But he, he puts like an idiot. So, you know, all of a sudden you learn to drive and you can't putt. And then a lot of guys can, can, can putt, can't drive. So you got to learn to do both. So I said, he's playing in Hartford Open and we're conversing every day. And I said, you want to win this tournament? I won it 60 years ago. I want you to win this tournament. What kind of pressure is that when you're instructed? No, 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 it's, no it's great. I don't it's, care about pressure. No, it's great, pre- though. Don't, don't, don't give me that pressure stuff. Okay. You either handle pressure or you don't handle it. Okay. That's it. That's, you better have the intestinal fortitude and the mindset to believe that you can do it. So, so I said, you're going to have to shoot 66 today to make the, to get into a playoff or win. It might be a, a playoff or a win. And I said, you need to tee it up. And the only thing you got on your mind is 66. You got to tee it up thinking that every hole you play, you're going to shoot a number that's 66. You better think that means you're going to have birdies, pars, birdies, pars, fewer bogeys. And if you don't think that way, you're going to shoot 72, pick up a check. You better think 66 because that's going to be the score that might win the tournament. Watson was leading the tournament. And he comes to this par three hole and he puts it in the water and makes it. He was leading by three shots. He made it. I think he made a double or triple on that hole. Now Duke and him, they're, Duke is, they're tied. So they come to the last hole and the kid that he was playing with, they were both tied. The kid got up and down from over the green and I think he pitched it in the hole. To t- Chris Stroud, I think. Chris right? Stroud. Yeah. So, now they're tied. They're in the playoff. They go back to that par three hole, par four hole. He drives the ball in the fairway. And the flag is in the right corner of the green. And it's right, the bunker is right next to the flag stick. And you don't go for that flag unless you know you're going to hit it dead straight. And I'm watching on TV. And I'm more nervous than he is. I bet, I bet. He takes his wedge out. And he does it right at the flag. He, he covers the flag stick and it hits and kicks a little to the right. I don't know. He did, it couldn't have been more than three or four feet. I had to leave the room. <laughs> I had to, I, I couldn't watch. I said, he's not going to make that putt. He's going to yank. He's going to choke. This, he's, all these years, he's now realizing he's going to win a PGA tournament. Well, he knocked it in. Yeah. And he then became one of the boys. Because once you win, you're in that inner circle. Well, he hasn't won since. 
But you know what? He won once. He's one of the boys now. Yep. And his wife said, if it hadn't been for you, Bob, Ken would have never made it. What was, uh, so did he call you right afterwards? Did he come yeah. see you right afterwards? What well, was he it? got on the mic. He said, if it hadn't been for Bob Tosse, I would have never won this tournament. Oh, that's and awesome. He, he couldn't throw enough accolades at me. That's great. And uh, he's, and he's, he still talks about that. Yeah. See? And I says, you can win again, but your problem is you just built a $3 million home on the water, on the, in the coastal. You now become happy at being a father and a husband instead of a competitor. You better get into competitive mood and feel like you're broke again. You got to be hungry. You got to want to win. When you were on the tour, who was the hungriest person you saw out there? Or, or, all the or, guys all, that were broke. All the guys. Are, okay. So, they, yeah, that's, hey, that I, guess, is, I guess you if had you're to be. broke, you're going to be hungry. Okay. But as far as like who just wanted to win tournaments just more than anyone, was it Hogan? Was it just someone? I think you have to understand your level of skill. Okay. If you don't have that level of skill, then you won't try to win. You'll just try to pick up a check. Gotcha. You got to know it as it gets this simple. Okay. You're going to a tournament. You want to win the tournament? Like I told Ken do, and I told any one of my students, go to the tournament, get, go to the score that keeps these scores every week and walk up to the score and say, what is the number that's going to win this tournament? And he'll say, 14 under par. You want to win a tournament? You got to shoot 14 under par. He said, I may miss it by one or two. But he says, this is not my first deal. And I'm usually, they, these guys keep these scores, they know. Sure. And they'll tell you what the score is. So if you really want to win the tournament, you better find a way to shoot 14 under par before you even tee it up. You better have a game plan. You better have a course management plan. You better have, you better have a, every time you step over that ball, you better believe you can make that golf swing. And if you have any doubt at all, your history. You better stay in the zone. Gotcha. But and there's more to it than just it's psychology. Mm -hmm. It's teaching people to become golf minded. Yeah. Thinking of how to make a number. Did Did you teach that at the golf digest schools? Were you teaching? Did, did you teach that mindset and how to think your way around the golf course in your golf Depending digest? Depending upon how much ability the player had. Okay. If he didn't have that kind of ability, I'd say, this is what you're going to shoot. This, this is, you're never going to shoot this number. Okay. You're not good enough. You don't drive it good enough. You don't hit the close to the flag enough. You don't putt good enough. <laughs> you don't have all those attributes. So do the best you can, pick up a check and have fun. Sure. And there are a lot of guys out there that just play for a check because they know they're not good enough to win. That's a fact. Yeah. When I was told, what a good swing I had and how good I could play. They said, you now have a golf swing that can win. You now have to believe you can take that swing and win. So by the time from 50 to 54, I was being prepared to learn how to score. And if you would have told me that I could shoot 14, 15, 16 under par when I first went on tour, I'd have said, you're out of your mind. So how did I learn that? Because my mentors, the demerits, they said, you now can score because you know how to play. Now it's a question is, knock it six feet and make it. Don't knock it six feet and miss it. And don't hit the next green from 40 feet and three putt. So, and that's golf. But I had a golfing mind. And I tried to teach a golfing mind. Uh -huh. And that's what you would have to do with your handicap. If you were gonna, if you were gonna turn pro and make a living at it, I said, okay, you're gonna go out there. There's a tournament you're playing next week. 14 under par is going to win the tournament. You think you can shoot 14 under par? No. Well, what do you think you can shoot? Well, let me play the golf course one time. Oh, so we go out and play, and you shot two under. And I said, well, two under times four is eight. If you shoot eight under par, you'll probably finish 10th or 12th or 5th. So you pick up a nice check. But you know that's not good enough. 
you got to learn to go low. We were, we, we, we used to get three or four on the pile. We tried to hold the lead instead of getting it. Today, these kids aren't, have no fear. They're not afraid to go low. How do you teach someone? How would you teach a, a pro that's, that's kind of middle of the road, that's shooting those two, three under pars? How do you teach that to someone? Get out and play golf with them and, and watch them play. And then you evaluate how well he plays from tee to green, how well he putts, how well he gets it up and down. And you say, you know, you have to improve on this and that and that. Because okay. I'm right there watching them. Okay, so you're not necessarily teaching a mindset. You're teaching the the, the gaps in their game. Well, they're that- not playing as good as they think they are. Right, okay. They're not putting as good as they think. They don't drive it as good as they I said, you got to do this, that. you got to improve on all these parts. If you don't, you're not going to win. You're going to just be another guy out there picking up a check. Just remember, you got 14 clubs to play 18 holes. You better learn. Byron said, I never tried to hit the ball further than 270 or 80. Because he said, I knew, I didn't care whether I had a 6-iron, a 7-iron, a 5-iron, a 4-iron. Whatever club I had, I knew I could dial it. Well, you put a 4-iron in some guy's hand now, and he's just trying to hit the green. And I said, no, you got to dial it up to fly. Oh, I can do that with a wedge, but then you better hit the son of a bitch closer to the green. <laughs> this is the kind of psychology you have to. This is what made me the great teacher I am. Teach people how to get more golf-minded about making a number. And people don't realize this. This is the only sport where you have to shoot a low number to get a big check. So you're not just teaching the principles of the golf swing. You're teaching your students how to mentally uh, mentally shoot the scores. Well, now they give a football player a $10 million contract to, to, to be able to catch the football to run, and, and, they, and they, yeah. they bust. Yeah. But they already got, they got the money in they the got bank. They the money, so they're done. Yeah. No, that's what's you, so great about no, our game. You've you got to go out and, and do and it. In golf, you've got to earn it. you got to do you've it. You've got to go play four rounds of golf. And the, the last day, the lowest number picks up the biggest check. Yeah. And if, you, if your number gets higher than the other guy, then you're going you're gonna to be picking up smaller checks. Yeah. You've got to earn your way. Yep. That's what's so great about the game. That's what's great about the game. So you've seen just about every great player that's come through over the last, what, 50 years? I mean, Well, I go all the way back to Hagen. Okay. And I'll tell you a story about Hagen. You please do. My idol and my, my brother's idol and Hagen, you know what? They said he drank a lot. He didn't drink that much. He he put he drank it half and put it somewhere on a windowsill. Sure. They thought he and we're playing in the Motor City Open at Red Run Golf Course with Ted Cole and I were were and Red Run had a parking lot that must have been a hundred yards long okay we're parked up at the the, the, the north end of the and here's a, a car pulls away down to the other end and who, who comes out of the car but Walter Burkhamo and Walter Hagen and I looked down there and I said Ted there's Walter Hagen he's with Walter Burkhamo now Burkhamo knew who I was because we played a lot of golf with me and he set this up with Hagen so He's walking toward our our Studebaker, and we're, I'm I'm acting like I'm putting my clubs in the trunk or taking them out. I'm trying to act like I don't even know he's coming. Just trying to be cool, right? Well, I, I mean, yeah, you just didn't I, want to, right? I, 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 I'm panicking. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm a rookie. I, and all of a sudden, guy tapped me on the shoulder. He says, "Are you Bob Tosky?" I said, yes, I am, Mr. Hagen. He said, well, Mr. Berkamo told me to say hello to you. And I says, well, I appreciate you saying hi. I said, and I had the presence of mind. I said, you know, Mr. Hagen, my brother Jack, my oldest brother, always admired you. He thought you were the living in. And he tried to emulate you. He had your long waggle. He smoked. He drank. He chased broads. And I'm telling them this story. And I said, I was caddying for him in this pro-am at my club. The first hole was a par five. And he had a good drive down the fairway. And he's going to try to knock this ball on the green in two. And the 
the harder, he, the bigger the swing you make, the bigger the waggle and the wider the stance was like yours. And he kept waggling and taking that wide stance. And I said, he cold topped that ball. <laughs> and I was catting when I said, well, Jack, you dress like Hagen, you smoke like Hagen, you drank like Hagen, but you don't play like Hagen. He chased me back to the clubhouse. He says, you're, you're done for the day. And Hagen was laughing his butt off. <laughs> I said, my brother admired you. And I'm telling you this. I had the presence of mind of telling that story. Uh -huh. And he says, what, what a great story. That's awesome. Wow. You had to learn how to talk on your feet. Sure. And I said, I met Walter Hagen. Yeah. So you've Gene met. Gene Sarazen. I met all the greats. Yeah, you realize yeah, that yeah. kind of association does for you? Uh, you grow up fast. Oh, I bet. Yeah. You know what? You hang around the best. Sooner or later, you, you can be the best. Well, that's kind of why I came here today. So let's uh, try to get some stories from the best. Well, sure. So, I mean, I, 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 could, I could talk to you for five hours about golf stories. Oh, gosh. That's how much, how many years I've had the experience with. I could tell you about Middlecoff, Mangrum, Bobby Locke, I could, Julius Boris. I could tell you stories about those guys that you wouldn't believe. But they're, they, it happened. It's a yeah. fact. Sure. No. Um, so uh, you, you, you go, know what? You, you go ahead. If, no, but I'm just saying that you can have all the money in the world, but if you have bad memories, well, I didn't make all the money in the world, but you know what? I had the best memories. The 50s were the best in my whole life. Um, I'll tell you a Ted Williams story. Please do. Who's Ted Williams? Uh, one of the greatest the hitters ever lived. The played for the Boston Red Sox. Splendid Splinter. Splendid Splinter. He used to go down to the Keys in the wintertime. And he'd come up to Ocean Reef and play golf at my club. Now I'm introduced to him. He's left-handed. And I'm watching him swing. And he's asking. I said, Ted. So we'd go out and play. And his angle of approach with the driver was that steep. So what's the ball going to do? So, yeah, so he's hitting down on it and the ball goes up. So uh, I'd out drive him every time. Now this guy's six foot. And yeah. Here I am. I'll drive him. And I got this roadrunner going. My ball is going, driving on the line. So when it hits the fairway, it bounces and goes forward. And this ball is going up and it comes down and it almost stops where it lands. And I said, you're never going to out drive me with that golf swing. Because your angle of approach? Sure. Well, he says, in baseball, you have to do that. I said, not in golf. I said, what's the hardest pitch to hit in baseball? He said, the one that's down by your where? Down by your feet. Well, I said, that's where you got to find a golf ball. Oh, well, now he's starting to... And he used to call me a little shit. <laughs> he says, and he'd say, and I'd, I'd go out there and I'll drive him... And I mean, I'm shooting four or five under par, and he's shooting high 70s or something. And he's mad. And he's challenging me intellectually, and I'm right on top of it every time. I said, Ted, I've forgotten more than you know about golf. You may know how to hit a baseball. But I said, You know, you got three fields to hit a baseball. You only have one field to hit a golf ball, too. In golf, you got to yeah. play your foul gotta balls. Play. I was just about to say, you got to play your foul balls. So now, and he kept saying, someday I'm going to get even with you. Someday I'm going to get even with you. Okay, Ted. So I had to go to Washington to do a clinic. So I take my son Bruce with me. I check in his hotel. Ted's the manager of the Washington Senators now. Yeah. So I get on the phone and I call him. I said, Ted, it's Bob Tosky. Bob Tosky, you out of mind? What are you, what are you calling me for? I says I'm in Washington. Oh, you little shit! What are you doing in Washington? I said I'm here to do a clinic. I'm doing an exhibition. And I said I'm. He says I don't believe you're in Washington. 
I said, I'm staying at this hotel. The name of the hotel, and I'm staying here, and I hung up. Okay. You know, what's he going to do? Uh, I'm assuming he's going to come try and find you. <laughs> no, he's going to call the hotel. Okay, okay. He's not going to go find me. Okay. So I get a call about five minutes later. He says, yeah, yeah, you are booked into this hotel. And he's, he keeps calling me a little shit. <laughs> so, you know, I always knew I had his number because intellectually I could stand up to him. So I said... You got a night ball game tonight. I like to come. He said, "You get to here an hour earlier. I want you to meet all the all the ball all the all the all of my ball players. Wear your white cap so the usher knows. Come over to stand over the dugout, and then when he sees your white cap, he'll call you down. I'll be at home plate in batting practice. I want you to get here early and meet all the guys." Usher sees me. He says, "You Toski?" I said, "Yeah, follow me." So we're walking toward home plate. I'm walking toward home plate. He's standing. Who's standing on home plate? Frank Howard. Yeah. He's yeah. massive. Yeah. The guy was, he said, say hello to Frank Howard, you little shit. So I go to shake hands with Frank Howard. You know what he does? He picks me up by my hips <laughs> and he lifts me up in the air and he says to Ted, Ted, there's nothing to this guy. <laughs> shit, he says, I can throw him against that background there. And, and backstop. Mm -hmm. He says, do that. So he's swinging me back and forth like this, <laughs> and Ted is laughing his ass off. And and I says, well, go ahead. Throw me. Somebody's got to catch me. So Ted, <laughs> so Frank, they're talking back. The players are laughing. The people in the gout and the backstops in the, are mm -hmm. laughing. He finally puts me down. And he, now then he shake hands with me, and Ted comes over and shake hands. He says, I told you I'd get even with you. Mm -hmm. the, the exposure to golf introduced me to Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Eddie Arcaro. I met all the greats in every sport. Well, I'm, I'm a baseball nut too, so maybe I need to do a, a baseball episode on this golf podcast and let you tell I baseball mean, it was just stories. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. Wow. Stories can go on that forever. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you got to give me a Hogan story. I, I can't. I can't leave without a Hogan okay. story. The I used to watch Ben practice. Okay. Now, I was introduced to him at the Greenbrier, and I had a picture taken, and I. I need to find that. I gave it to my sister and they lost it, but I need to get the green bar. People see if they can. I'm just a rookie. And the guy says, you're going to have your picture taken with Hogan and Sneed. Oh. So here I am standing in the middle. Hogan's on my right. And Sam's on my left. Here I'm this kid. Like, oh, I really should have won my watch. <laughs> and this, that was, I was about, uh, Let's see, 23 or 4 years old. And I hadn't won anything. And I was just a new rookie in there. And I got this picture. And I got to try to relocate that picture. But yeah. That was my introduction to Ben Hogan. It was just Bob Tosky. Hi, Bob. That was it. So then when I when I get on tour and he's practicing, I go over and watch him. But he never said never said a word while he practiced. Now I watched him about twelve times. I, this was at Riviera. This time he's practicing at Riviera, Riviera Country. Yep, Los Angeles. And I'm standing in back of him. And I, if he's that way, I'm standing back there. Okay. And I then I'd move to the front to look at his grip and his ball position. Then I'd move back to see the plane of the swing, the direction of the club, and blah blah blah. And a pair of white shoes on. And I'm trying to move a little closer. I made a mistake of getting too close. He looked back at me and he took his hand. He went, <laughs> I backed up. Right. He said, get your ass back there. You're too, I can see your white shoes. He finishes practicing. I go back to my locker and you know, there he shows up. His locker is 
two lockers away from mine. And he's sitting there and I'm sitting there. And he looks over at me and, and he always looked at you and stared. He, he had hawk eyes. They call him the hawk for nothing. Right. You were out there a long time today, Bob. I said, Ben, I was out here as long as you were. And I pointed at him like this, but gently. I said, I was out there as long as you were, Ben. Yes, you were. Did you learn anything? I said, Ben, every time you made a golf swing, I learned something. He looked at me. He gave me a half smile. He said, good. Threw the shoes in the locker. I walked out. Off he went. That was the end of the lesson. <laughs> That's my story about Ben Houghton. There you go. But every time I watched him practice, I never talked to him. Never asked him any questions. He respected that. Yeah. So every time he'd see me, if he was in the dining room with his wife, Valerie, he'd come over and say, hi, Bob. And he didn't say hello to everybody. No. He'd come over and say, nice to see you, Bob. Because he respected the fact that I wanted to learn by watching him practice. And I never played with him. I never, never, were never able to, no? Never played with him. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you one more story about him. That, <laughs> I don't tell this to everybody. I'm playing in this tournament at Brevier. Okay. And this is the first round. First of all, the par five. Hogan's two... Two threesomes and back of me. Okay. I birdie the par five. I make a hell of a par in that second hole, which is a wicked par four. I par the next hole, which is a par four. We get to the par three, which is 200 and some odd yards, and there's a big hold up on the tee. The win of the win, and there's two or three threesomes on the tee. And I want to get off that tee before he gets uh -huh. to the green sure. and on the next tee. And the timing was perfect. Son of a bitch. I'm getting ready to tee it up, and he breaks through the gallery. And instead of me looking at the target, I'm looking back, and there he is, white cap, walks in there, and he's, I had a three wood in my hand. I took a divot <laughs> with a tee, and I was past the ball before it landed. <laughs> Just to get the hell out of there. And he was playing with Zell Eaton. Okay. From, and he says to Zell, I heard him say, who the hell is that? He says, that's some, that's Bob Tusky. Some young kid, they say he's going to be a hell of a player. And he's going like this. I could see him shaking his head. I shot 80. <laughs> I made five in a hole. My game went right down the fucking tube. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, <He> <laughs> <I'm trying laughs> but that's the, I guess that's the Hogan effect. Um, wow. You could all go on getting intimidated by the presence of a um, player. Yeah. I, I'm guessing he was probably the most intimidating out there at the time. No one close. The only thing he ever said was your way. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, he, was, he, he played one guy and he made a hole in one on the spar three. And they said, what'd you make, Ben? He said, I made two. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, he didn't uh, give a shit about the yeah, He's like, I guess it's your honor. Yeah, I remember that. I remember reading that story. About, sure. about, about, uh, the guy. Well, that's the mindset he had. Yeah, he's like, I don't, give, I don't care. Wow. Um, but watching them practice, concentration in the zone, baby. He didn't want to talk to anybody. It was he, the ball, and the club, and the target. That's it. So, so when you're seeing diff different tournaments and you see the, you know, when Golf Channel shows people on the driving range and you see everyone talking, you get all the, it doesn't look like they're working as hard. That's not even remotely close to what Hogan and, and the people of your era were doing. You guys were well, working. Well, they, look, they got so much money in their pocket that they can what? They, they can be nice to each other. Yeah. You were, you were my enemy. Because I had to play better than you to make a good check. Yeah. I didn't have 20 million in the bank, or 10 million. So now if I got all of them, I can be nice to you. <laughs> sure. So it's all changed. Yeah. So that's why they're so nice to each other. They look at, they're all, they're, they're so wealthy, they can be afford to be nice to each other. So I guess. But, but I when they tee it up. Yeah. Yeah, when they tee it that up. That changes. Yeah. Well, I guess the last one that really was 
kind of aloof and really zoned in all the time was Tiger when he came on in, in 97, 98. So I guess he's the last one because you're right. Nowadays, they're all seem to be buddy, buddy. And did you ever do TV? Yeah, I was a golf commentator. Okay. And I'm which, like these guys today. And which, so which, uh, and this is in the 80s, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is right around. Uh, in, the, in the 70s. I think. 70s. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that was around, you know, Weisskopf. Yeah, I remember Nick having, was, with Weisskopf and Howard Cosell, we had a, we had a, a luncheon meeting. Oh my gosh. You worked with Howard Cosell? No, Howard Cassell worked with me. Oh, I'm sorry. I just walked right into that one. Shit. Um. No, we had a lunch <laughs> meeting, and and uh, he said, you know what I like about you, Bob? You say it like it is. Yes. And I said, well, I think I learned that from you, Howard. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and Weisskopf, this whole meeting was Howard Cassell and Bob Toski, and Weisskopf was just- He's just sitting in the corner. Sitting there and having fun. He used to talk about Muhammad Ali. I said, you're talking about Cassius Clay? Oh, oh he says, no, it's not Cassius Clay. It's Muhammad Ali. I know. I said, it's Cassius Clay to me. I always knew him as Cassius Clay. Sure. And he says, he swung like a, he danced like a butterfly, float, stung float, like float, a bee. Float like a butterfly, sing like a bee, yeah. Well, yeah. I said, you know, I, I did the same thing at all. So I danced like a butterfly and stung like a bee. We'd have this, he says, I like your style. You had to know how to go one-on-one -on -one with people. Sure. Yeah, I've done it all. Commentator, teacher, player, <laughs> writer, club maker. Um, I guess we're going to wrap it up here. Let well, me leave it with you this way. We who teach must never cease to learn on how to become better teachers. You who have learned must never cease to apply properly how you learn. So attention to detail and proper practice versus improper practice will make you a better golfer. But a lot of people practice improperly because they don't have another set of eyes to watch and see. So it's a constant evaluation of learning and improving. And even at 91. There you have it. Another amazing episode here at the back of the range. Cannot thank Bob Toski enough for taking the time to speak with me last month. Bob, we wish you the best speedy recovery. I know you'll be out in the range pretty soon giving people lessons. Again, follow us on Instagram. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We'll be back next week for another episode here at the back of the range.